All right, well, it is 8 a.m., so we will get started. I am delighted to welcome everybody. This is the kickoff of our uh, series of chief resident talks, um, and our um, first speaker in the series is Dr. Lauren Banachek. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, Dr. Banachek is our current Bridges Family Endowed Chief Resident for our Internal Medicine Residency Program. Lauren got her bachelor's degree in molecular biology from University of Wisconsin here, and then went on to Cleveland Clinic to get her MD degree, uh, and she graduated with a distinction in biomedical research. While at Cleveland Clinic, she was honored and selected as a NIH Medical Research Scholar Program participant, which is a um, year-long program where you spend a, uh, the time at the NIH in a, um, in a lab for those who are interested in becoming physician scientists. She was successful there with a number of publications, including an American Society of Hematology Achievement Award. Um, she then went on to her residency program here and was selected as chief resident. And during her chief resident year, she's led many uh, initiatives, including the creation of an online evidence-based medicine curriculum. She has led the residency wellness committee and has been intimately involved in leading the development of a curriculum in research uh, for the residents uh, that includes a didactic series. She has also continued to be involved in research and has created a database of almost 500 patients who are currently being treated for hematologic malignancies um, at University of Wisconsin for the past 10 years and um, is using this data to look at um, molecular testing patterns, treatment strategies, and outcomes um, for our patient population. We're, and we are looking forward to hearing about the results of that one. She has received a numerous awards and honors, including the very prestigious UW Hildale Research Fellowship as an undergraduate student. She has been the recipient of numerous American Society of Hematology Abstract Achievement Awards and has been the recipient of the John Phillips MD Award for Excellence in Internal Medicine. We are very fortunate that Dr. Banachek will be staying with us to continue uh, with a fellowship in hematology oncology here at UW starting in a month. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> her goal is to continue in academics uh, with a, as a physician scientist educator, um, focusing on translational research and medical education. Today, she's going to be talking to us about rewriting the genome, the history of CRISPR and its clinical applications. So Dr. Banaschek. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Schnapp, and for the opportunity to speak today. I have no relevant financial disclosures. We are at the beginning of a new era. In my opinion, there have been three great scientific revolutions in modern times. In the first half of the 20th century, Albert Einstein wrote his papers on relativity and quantum theory. And this spurred a scientific revolution in the field of physics, eventually leading to nuclear power, lasers, and radar. The second half of the 20th century was defined by a revolution in information technology. This led to the microchip, the computer, and the internet. We are now at the precipice of a new scientific revolution, one that we as physicians can take part of. We are now experiencing a life science revolution in which DNA is the star of the show. And the catalyst for this revolution has been CRISPR. CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, is a new gene editing technology just developed in the last decade that has taken the world by storm. CRISPR has exploded in the scientific community since its development. This graph shows the number of PubMed publications over time that have the word CRISPR or Cas9 in the title. You can clearly see the exponential growth of this technology just in the past decade. This graph was created midway through 2018, and the number of publications by the end of that year was projected to exceed 5,000. Even in the lay media, 
everyone is talking about CRISPR, its therapeutic implications, and ethical considerations. You may be thinking to yourself, I don't need to care about CRISPR. I'm a clinician. I see patients. I don't work in a lab. CRISPR is just for these guys. Well, today I will argue and hopefully convince you that you should care about CRISPR. CRISPR is not just for Nobel laureates and experts in genetic engineering. The technology is simple and accessible. It's so simple that a graduate student or even a medical student is able to use it. CRISPR is going to change the way that we practice medicine. Thus, my learning objectives for today are for you to identify best practices in scientific innovation using the discovery of CRISPR as a framework. Describe the current therapeutic and clinical applications of CRISPR and understand the future of CRISPR gene editing technology as it relates to medical practice. To do this, we'll divide our talk into three parts today. First, we will go through the history of the discovery of CRISPR. Then we'll discuss current clinical applications. And finally, we'll look to the future. I will first share with you the history of CRISPR's discovery and application as a gene editing tool. The story of CRISPR begins with the publication of this previously little known paper published in the Journal of Bacteriology in 1987. Yoshizumi Ishino was a graduate student at Osaka University in Japan. He was studying the IAP gene in E. coli and succeeded in sequencing the approximately 1,000 base pairs that made up this gene. When he analyzed his results, he noticed an oddity. He found what he called an unusual structure at the very end or three prime end of the IAP gene. What I'm showing you here is the nucleotide sequence of that gene that Ashino sequenced. Remember that DNA is composed of a sugar phosphate backbone and a nitrogenous base. There are four bases in DNA, adenine indicated by A, thymine indicated by T, guanine indicated by G, and cytosine indicated by C. We read the sequence of a gene like a book from left to right, and the end of one line here continues on to the next. When Ashino looked very closely, he was able to find five sequences of 29 nucleotides that were nearly identical. Now, repetitive sequences in the genome are not unusual, but they're usually tandem or back-to-back, like in this schematic in which each colored region corresponds to the repetitive sequence. However, the repeats that Ashino found were interspersed by five non-repetitive sequences, which he called spacers. This is indicated by the black bars here in the schematic. Even more intriguing, the repeats also seem to be palindromes, meaning they read the same backwards and forwards. Now, this can be tricky to spot, and Ashina was very astute to find this. When looking at this sequence now, you may be thinking to yourself that these sequences don't look like palindromes at all. However, remember that DNA is a double-stranded structure with both strands being complements of one another. C binds to G, A binds to T. You need to imagine the double-stranded structure of DNA like so in order to appreciate the palindromes. Repeats like this in the genome that are interspersed by non-repetitive elements and palindromic had never been described before. The uniqueness of these repeats suggested a particular purpose, yet Ashino had no idea what these sequences were or what their function was. He wrote in his paper, the biological significance of these sequences are not known, and he did not pursue the topic any further. These mystery repeats were not revisited again until 1990. At that time, a graduate student named Francisco Mojica at the University of Alicante was sequencing regions of the genome of archaea species he thought may explain their affinity for salt. Again, we are looking here at the nucleotide sequence of a gene with each letter corresponding to the nucleotide base 
Mojica found several identical DNA sequences that were repeated at regular intervals, just like Ashino found. At first, he thought he made a mistake and messed up his sequencing, but he sequenced again and again, and the data still kept showing the same repeats. At this point, he thought maybe he was onto something. Google didn't exist at this point in time, so he manually sorted through citations using the word repeat as his search term, and eventually he found Ashino's paper. Now, E. coli is a very different organism from the archaea that Mojica was studying, so this was a surprising finding. He noted that the presence of these repeats in both archaea and bacteria demonstrate the widespread nature of this peculiar structure. He thought incorrectly that these repeats may be involved in cell division. Over the next few years, more and more microbial genomes were sequenced, and by the year 2000, repeats were found in more than 40% of bacteria and 90% of archaea. By 2002, Mojica, along with Ruud Janssen, a researcher at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, coined the term CRISPR or clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats to describe these genetic elements. At this time, several clusters of CRISPR associated, associated or CAS genes were identified adjacent to these repeats. And these were found to encode for enzymes, which we'll discuss a little bit later. A breakthrough came in 2005 the ever-persistent Mojica began to analyze the spacer sequences, separating the CRISPR repeats, and found an important clue as to their function. He found that these sequences corresponded to DNA found in viruses that infect bacteria, also known as bacteriophages. Bacteria with these spacer sequences did not become infected by a virus that had the same DNA sequence. However, bacteria without the spacer sequence did get infected. All of this suggested that CRISPR was a sort of defense system against viruses and served an immune function. However, at this time, the exact mechanism by which CRISPR provided this immunity was not known. The team who provided the first experimental evidence of CRISPR as an immune system actually have local ties. Both Philippe Horvath and Rodolphe Berengu worked for Danisco, a Danish food ingredient company. Though Horvath was located in France, Berengu at the time was actually working at Danisco's branch here in Madison, Wisconsin. Danisco makes starter cultures for yogurt and cheese, which is a very lucrative market, especially here in Wisconsin. The greatest threat to this work are viruses that destroy the bacteria of the starter cultures. Thus, Danisco invested lots of time, resources, and money in learning how bacteria can defend themselves against these viruses. Horvath and Berengu were tasked with this work, and they began a collaboration to study CRISPR. Danisco had a unique asset as Horvath and Berengu embarked on their studies. They had a historical repository of the strains of bacteria used over the years, as well as the strain of bacteriophages that had caused any viral outbreaks over the years. They noticed that bacteria that had been collected soon after a viral outbreak had new spacers in the CRISPR loci with DNA sequences corresponding to those viruses and that the bacteria were then immune to that particular viral strain. Then they showed that they could engineer this immunity by adding their own spacer sequences using genetic engineering techniques. They added sequences from a particular virus and then demonstrated the immunity to that virus. Finally, they also showed that Cas enzymes were critical for this viral resistance. When genes encoding these Cas enzymes were knocked out in a bacteria previously resistant to a particular virus, that immunity was lost. This was the first experimental evidence for CRISPR as an adaptive immune system 
and their findings were published in the journal Science. However, the mechanism by which CRISPR conferred this microbial immunity was still unknown at this time. After publication of their work, a rapid series of studies followed demonstrating other key features of CRISPR. Most importantly, it was established that the target of the CRISPR system was viral DNA. Furthermore, it was discovered that the CRISPR arrays were transcribed and that the spacer regions were somehow converted into a small RNA that served as a guide for the Cas proteins, and that these Cas proteins exhibited endonuclease activity, meaning they were able to cleave invading DNA. These discoveries were game changers. The fact that DNA was the target suggested that CRISPR could be used as a gene editing tool. And the fact that the CRISPR RNAs acted as a guide suggested that this tool could be easily programmable since nucleic acids are relatively simple to design and modify in the lab. At this point in our story, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier begin their collaboration. Both had already made their own contributions to the CRISPR world. Jennifer Doudna, a researcher at the University of California in Berkeley, had characterized the structure and function of some of the Cas proteins. Emmanuel Charpentier, a French scientist working in Sweden at the time, had shown that something called the transactivating or tracer RNA was necessary for the CRISPR system to work. Both researchers attended a conference in Puerto Rico in 2011, and they had a chance meeting in between sessions in which they discussed their work and their goals for the future. Charpentier suggested that she and Downa begin working together to study CRISPR. Thankfully, Downa agreed, and they began a long distance collaboration that would change the world. Members of their lab would literally work around the clock. As the workday ended in Berkeley, Downa's postdoc would Skype or email with Charpentier's postdoc, and the work would continue in Sweden. Their hard work definitely paid off. Downa and Charpentier were the first to fully characterize the CRISPR system in prokaryotic cells. Let's not put everything together based on their work. CRISPR arrays in the bacterial genome consist of CRISPR repeats and spacers interspersed between these repeats, which correspond to DNA found in viruses. These regions of the genome are readily transcribed. The resulting RNA product, called a CRISPR RNA, contains the viral DNA and can be loaded onto Cas9, which is an endonuclease, or an enzyme that cleaves DNA. If the CRISPR RNA is allowed to interact with its complementary sequence, during a viral infection perhaps, the Cas9 is then induced to cleave the invading DNA, thus rendering the virus ineffective. This is how the native CRISPR system works in a bacterial cell to defend itself against viruses. Downa and Charpentier went one step further and exploited this mechanism to show that this CRISPR system could be reprogrammed to target any DNA sequence in the genome. They designed their own CRISPR guide RNA and showed that Cas9 could cleave the DNA sequence of their gene of interest by the same mechanisms. Now, what happens after CRISPR creates a double-stranded break in the DNA? If left unattended, the cell uses its own repair mechanisms to repair the double-stranded break in a process called non-homology end joining. This process is quite error-prone and results in random insertions and deletions of nucleotides, also known as an indel mutation. This disrupts the gene structure, leading to a frame shift mutation and ultimately a premature stop codon, thus resulting in knockout of the gene. However, if a DNA template is introduced along with the CRISPR system, this template can facilitate homology-directed repair in which a specific DNA sequence is inserted at the target site. This leads to precise gene editing. Again, this was a game changer. 
Doudna and Charpentier provided clear evidence that CRISPR could be used as a gene editing tool and can be programmable. The implications of this are immense. This was the first time ever that researchers had an extremely accessible and flexible tool that could be guided to anywhere in the genome just by designing a very short guide RNA. CRISPR can be used to induce mutations in any gene, as we saw. But more importantly, CRISPR, along with additional techniques to guide repair of the double-stranded break, could be used to rewrite the genome. Not surprisingly, Doudna and Charpentier were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their groundbreaking work. After characterization of the CRISPR system in prokaryotes, the race was on to show that this could work in eukaryotic cells. And this was accomplished just one year later, in 2013. Fang Zhang of the Broad Institute of MIT was the first to show that CRISPR could be used in human cells. He also made some modifications to allow the system to enter the nucleus and to optimize its performance in a eukaryotic system. This was a very tight race, and Zhang submitted his paper just three weeks before George Church submitted his findings to the same journal. Church was actually Zhang's former mentor, and he was just up the road at Harvard. However, neither knew of the other's interest or work in CRISPR. Their papers were both published in the same issue of Science in January of 2013. Later that month, Doudna published her own work using CRISPR in human cells in the journal eLife. And this was closely followed by publications from two other labs, led by Jin Soo Kim in South Korea and Keith Jung of Harvard. So after the first report of these intriguing repeats in E. coli in 1987, in less than 20 years, CRISPR was further categorized, optimized for a eukaryotic system, and exploited to serve as a gene editing tool. This timeline is nothing short of spectacular and demonstrates the importance of teamwork, but also a little bit of competition in driving scientific innovation. Now, this is a cool story, but why should we care? How is this relevant to us as clinicians? And how is this relevant to our patients? Well, now we're going to move from the bench to the bedside to discuss some of the clinical applications of CRISPR that are already in the pipeline. We will briefly discuss how CRISPR has been applied to HIV, refractory cancer, hemoglobinopathies, and in the diagnosis of infectious diseases. Let's first discuss the use of CRISPR in treating HIV. The first pilot human trials using genome editing with CRISPR were conducted in patients with HIV. The main focus of these studies has been on targeting CCR5. As you will recall, CCR5 is a receptor on CD4 T cells that acts as a co-receptor for the HIV virus. Mutating CCR5 by gene editing has been postulated as a possible approach to making cells resistant to HIV infection. In 2019, investigators in China reported the first allogeneic bone marrow transplantation of CCR5 CRISPR edited hematopoietic stem cells into a 27 year old patient with HIV infection who developed acute lymphocytic leukemia, or ALL. Hematopoietic stem cells that were a complete HLA match to the patient were acquired from a donor. The cells were then edited using CRISPR in the lab to knock out the CCR5 receptor. And then the cells were transplanted into the patient after he received myoblative conditioning. This graph shows the patient's cell counts over time. From an ALL standpoint, neutrophil engraftment occurred at day 27, which is the normal timing, and all of his blood counts normalized over time. At four weeks, he was found to have full donor chimerism, meaning that all of his blood cells were of donor origin. He had a full morphologic remission of his ALL, which continued over the 19-month follow-up period. He experienced the expected side effects of bone marrow transplantation, but did not experience any adverse effects attributable to CRISPR gene editing or CCR5 mutation. The study authors next looked at the efficiency of their CRISPR gene editing. 
This graph shows the percentage of total cells with CCR5 mutation stratified by cell type. As you can see, the proportion of cells in the bone marrow with CCR5 mutation was quite low, less than 10% across the board. And when we look at CD CD4 cells in particular, this was even less, around 2%. The authors then obtained consent from the patient to stop antiretroviral therapy seven months after transplant when his CD4 count had recovered to the normal range and his HIV viral load was undetectable. Antiretroviral therapy was stopped during this four-week time frame shaded in gray. You can appreciate that his viral load increased during this time period and then gradually decreased to an undetectable level after resuming antiretroviral therapy. So what can we take away from this study? Overall, the study showed the safety and feasibility of transplantation of CRISPR-edited hematopoietic stem cells. The CRISPR-edited hematopoietic stem cells were able to successfully engraft and differentiate into multiple lineages that retain the gene editing over time. However, the gene editing efficiency was clearly very low and a barrier to clinical efficacy in the study. And the gene editing efficiency of this particular CRISPR protocol will definitely need to be drastically improved in order to achieve a cure of HIV. Let's switch gears now to discuss the use of CRISPR in the treatment of refractory cancer. Most cancers are recognized and attacked by the immune system, but can progress due to evasion mechanisms developed by the tumor. T cells are specialized immune cells that are essential for the anti-tumor immune response and have been at the forefront of the modern day cancer immunotherapy revolution. One of the most promising areas of cancer immunotherapy is adoptive immunity in which a patient's own T cells are genetically engineered to express a transgenic T cell receptor that specifically binds to and kills the patient's tumor cells. Limitations of this approach have been persistence of the endogenous T cell receptor, which dilutes the efficacy of the transgenic T cell receptor, and T cell dysfunction or exhaustion due to regulatory signals, such as PD-1 expression. This group led by Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania designed the first in human phase one clinical trial to test the feasibility and safety of CRISPR gene editing to treat refractory cancer. T cells were taken out of the patient. The cells were then genetically engineered to express a T cell receptor specific for an antigen present on the patient's tumor cells using previously established techniques. CRISPR was then used to knock out the genes encoding the alpha and beta chains of the T cell receptor to minimize expression of the endogenous T cell receptor, which we know can blunt the anti-tumor response. CRISPR was also used to knock out the PD-1 receptor to ameliorate this inhibitory mechanism of T cell function. The cells were then infused back into the patient. Three patients with advanced refractory cancer were not responding to multiple lines of chemotherapy were enrolled. Two patients with multiple myeloma and one patient with advanced sarcoma. The infusions were well tolerated and there were no cases of cytokine release syndrome or other adverse effects in the study. So what happened after infusion of the CRISPR edited cells? This graph demonstrates the number of circulating engineered T cells over time for each patient. You can appreciate that all three patients experienced high peak levels and sustained persistence of the engineered T cells over time, indicating engraftment. After infusion, two of the patients experienced stable disease for several months. Patient 39 with advanced sarcoma actually had an impressive decrease in size of an abdominal mass that was sustained for several months. Unfortunately, both of these patients have progressed and are now receiving other therapies. The third patient did not respond at all to therapy and unfortunately died to progressive multiple myeloma. So what can we take away from this study? Overall, the study again demonstrates the safety and feasibility of CRISPR human T cell engineering in patients with advanced refractory cancer. The CRISPR edited cells were able to engraft and the gene editing persisted over time, 
Given the response of two of the patients, there's also a hint of efficacy in treating refractory cancer using CRISPR, though the study was much too small to conclusively assess for clinical benefit, and larger clinical trials are needed in order to formally assess this. Let's now discuss the treatment of hemoglobinopathies. Given my interest in hematology, I am most excited about this next study that I will share with you today. Sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia are the most common monogenic disorders worldwide. They are both caused by mutations in the hemoglobin beta chain gene. In thalassemia, absent or reduced beta globin synthesis leads to ineffective hematopoiesis. In sickle cell disease, the abnormal beta globin leads to the formation of sickle hemoglobin, which has a tendency to polymerize under stress. This leads to hemolysis, anemia, vasoocclusive episodes, end organ damage, and ultimately reduced life expectancy. In both diseases, lower morbidity and mortality is associated with elevated levels of fetal hemoglobin, in which beta globin is replaced by gamma globin. As you may recall, the production of fetal hemoglobin is developmentally regulated. This graph shows the percent globin subunit synthesis on the y-axis and time relative to birth and months on the x-axis. As you can see, gamma globin and fetal hemoglobin, represented by the blue line, is produced in utero and decreases postnatally as the production of beta globin and adult hemoglobin, represented by the black line, increases. The transcription factor BCL11A is responsible for this shift and represses the expression of gamma globin and thus fetal hemoglobin. In this study, the investigators collected hematopoietic stem cells from the patients and then modified the cells in the lab using CRISPR to induce a mutation in the enhancer region of BCL11A. This led to reduced BCL11A expression, which allowed for the production of gamma globin and fetal hemoglobin in erythroid cells. The cells were then infused back into the patients after they received myoablative conditioning. In contrast to the HIV study that we previously discussed, the gene editing efficiency was much better in the study, with a gene editing frequency of 80% of hematopoietic stem cells and their progeny. Two patients were enrolled in the study. Patient one had a diagnosis of beta thalassemia and was transfusion dependent with an average of 34 transfusions per year. At baseline, the patient had a total hemoglobin of 14, or excuse me, nine grams per deciliter with fetal hemoglobin making up just 3%. 18 months after infusion of the CRISPR edited cells, her total hemoglobin had risen to 14 grams per deciliter with fetal hemoglobin making up 93%. This schematic depicts the timing of transfusion support relative to transplant, which is marked by the transition from dark gray to light gray. You can see that the patient last required a blood transfusion one month after infusion of the CRISPR edited cells and has not required a transfusion in over 21 months of follow up. Patient two had a diagnosis of sickle cell disease with an average of seven vasoocclusive episodes per year. At baseline, the patient had a total hemoglobin level of 7.2 grams per deciliter, with fetal hemoglobin making up 9% and sickle hemoglobin making up 74%. 15 months after infusion of the CRISPR edited cells, her total hemoglobin had risen to 12 grams per deciliter, with fetal hemoglobin making up 43% and sickle hemoglobin making up 52%. Again, the schematic depicts the timing of transfusion support an occurrence of vasoocclusive events relative to transplant, which is marked again by the transition from dark gray to light gray. She last required a blood transfusion 19 days after infusion of the CRISPR edited cells and has had no episodes of vasoocclusive events in 17 months of therapy. There were a number of adverse events in this study, including neutropenic fever, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, sepsis, and cholithiasis all of which are known complications of bone marrow transplantation and all of which resolved. In summary, the study authors here showed that their approach led to high levels of allelic editing, 
and durable engraftment of the CRISPR edited cells. This led to high levels of fetal hemoglobin and most excitingly eliminated the need for transfusions and vasoocclusive episodes in the patient with sickle cell disease. Given that the study only included two patients, the generalizability is still unclear, but these are nonetheless very exciting results. This therapy has the potential to be life-changing for millions of patients affected by these very morbid diseases. Finally, I wanted to provide a brief example to demonstrate that CRISPR is not just for therapeutics, but can also be used in diagnostic assays. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a novel diagnostic device to detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus called Stop COVID was created by Sherlock Biosciences, a biotechnology firm led by Fang Zhang of MIT, who we met earlier. This is a simple point of care CRISPR-based as opposed to PCR-based test that takes about one hour to complete. The test reagent contains a CRISPR molecule to detect the presence of a specific genetic signature. In this case, the genetic signature of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. When the signature is found, the CRISPR endonuclease is activated and this releases a detectable signal in the system. The test itself is quite simple to use and was developed such that it could even be performed by lay users. The lab technician or the patient transfers the patient's saliva or nasopharyngeal sample to the Sherlock system. The sample is heated for one hour and then a detection strip is dipped into the sample. The strip then displays either a positive or a negative result, just like a pregnancy test. This technology has been applied to other viruses, not just COVID, and you can imagine the implications. This method is deployable, fast, and can be used in low resource clinics globally, and can even be deployed at home, which would result in more effective tests, trace, and isolate procedures necessary to end a pandemic. Validation experiments using the STOP COVID system were promising, and last May, the FDA granted emergency use authorization. Finally, let's move to the third part of our talk and discuss the future of CRISPR and what we should expect as clinicians. In addition to the clinical applications we already discussed, there are ongoing clinical trials in several disease states, including multiple myeloma, BALL, TALL, bladder cancer, prostate cancer, renal cell carcinoma, HPV infection, and again, HIV infection. Furthermore, preclinical work is ongoing in obesity, epilepsy, Huntington's disease, hemophilia, familial hypercholesterolemia, phenylketonuria, dementia, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and even male pattern baldness. This is what's in the pipeline. It's clear that no matter what kind of doctor you are, CRISPR will one day affect you and your patients. Though CRISPR will one day affect how we practice medicine, that world is still a long way off. What are the current limitations? What work is left to do? Well, I see four challenges that need to be overcome before CRISPR becomes a part of our daily practice. For one, a major concern for implementing CRISPR for gene therapy is the potential for off-target effects or cutting where you don't wanna cut. It's possible with bioinformatic techniques to determine places in the genome where off-target effects are most likely to occur based on the sequence of your guide RNA. It's become standard in studies involving CRISPR to sequence these locations to assess for off-target effects. And thankfully, the frequency of off-target effects is quite low. Nonetheless, this rate is not zero, and this needs to be studied and addressed before widespread implementation of CRISPR into clinical practice can occur. Currently, there are many labs working on developing engineered Cas9 variants that are high fidelity and reduce the number of off-target effects. Another challenge to overcome is the relatively low gene editing efficiency of CRISPR in some cases. As we saw today in the HIV study, poor efficiency of CRISPR can limit therapeutic potential. So this will need to be optimized to maximize clinical benefit. Even in the past five years, remarkable progress has been made in this regard, and I expect nothing less moving forward. 
It's also important to note that we don't need 100% gene editing efficiency in order to exert a clinical effect. As we saw in the hemoglobinopathy study, with 80% gene editing efficiency and 43% fetal hemoglobin, patient number two essentially had no manifestations of her sickle cell disease. Many genetic diseases are like this, in which just a little bit of the normal functioning protein goes a long way. Furthermore, most of what I showed you today involved the formation of double-stranded breaks and insertion deletion mutations, or indels, in the target genes to create a gene knockout, like on the left-hand side of this figure we saw earlier today. However, CRISPR can also edit mutated genes back to their normal sequence using a special templated root pair. This is the holy grail of gene editing, but such precise gene editing is a lot harder to do compared with the creation of indel mutations. This technology is still at this time in its infancy and limited by low efficiency, but we'll get there one day. Next, getting CRISPR to the place that it needs to go can also be challenging, and the delivery modality of CRISPR greatly influences its therapeutic scope. In all the studies I shared with you today, an ex vivo delivery approach was used in which cells were modified using CRISPR outside the patient and then reintroduced back. The advantages of this ex vivo approach include greater safety, since the patients are not directly exposed to the gene altering tool, technical feasibility, as we saw extensively today, and tighter quality control of the edited cells. However, disadvantages of this approach are limited survival and retention of cell function once outside the body, and the need for extensive cell culture, as anyone who's ever worked in a lab can tell you. This ex vivo approach, as we saw today, also works really well for treating hematologic and immunologic disorders because the CRISPR cells can be introduced back by transplantation. But many tissue types are not suited for this method, which limits CRISPR scope and therapeutic utility for other genetic diseases. In order to combat this, augmentation of in vivo approaches of CRISPR delivery are needed to expand the ability of CRISPR to treat a broader array of diseases. In this in vivo approach, the CRISPR system can be introduced locally to, to, to specific tissues by injection or systemically. As you can imagine, there are many limitations to this approach, including potential clearance of the CRISPR system by the immune system, and ensuring that the CRISPR system is able to traverse the endothelium and be internalized by the target cells. Though these techniques are still being refined, trials using this in vivo approach are currently underway. The KCI Institute of OHSU in Portland, Oregon, is now conducting the Brilliance clinical trial in which they inject fluid containing the CRISPR system into the retina of patients of labor congenital amaurosis which is a congenital form of blindness. This is the first time that CRISPR is being used to edit genes in the body or using this in vivo approach. Early results from the study are scheduled to be released by the end of 2021. Finally, CRISPR and gene editing technology in general introduced immense ethical considerations. This could be the topic of a whole separate Grand Rounds talk and unfortunately, we don't have adequate time to devote to this discussion today. The applications we discussed today all took place in somatic cells, which are not heritable or passed down to offspring. However, this technology is also feasible for germline editing, in which CRISPR is used on the DNA in human eggs or sperm or early stage embryos, so that every cell in the resulting child and all of their descendants will carry the edited trait. As you can imagine, this potential for human germline editing is highly controversial and has been hotly debated. Scientists and leaders in the CRISPR field, including Doudna, have urged caution and have imposed somewhat of a moratorium on germline editing. However, despite these efforts, germline editing has already been performed. Zhang Baihe is a Chinese scientist who completed graduate school at Rice University and a postdoctoral research fellowship at Stanford. After his studies, he returned to China, and in 2018, he began to think about gene editing 
and made plans to use CRISPR to edit human embryos. He proposed editing the CCR5 receptor in embryos born to couples with HIV infection, and then transferring the edited embryos back to the women for pregnancy. This would allow their babies to be protected from the HIV virus, as would all their descendants. There should already be a number of red flags going through your mind right now. Firstly, gene editing of CCR5 in this case is not medically necessary. There are many more highly effective and simpler ways to prevent HIV infection in the baby in this case, such as sperm washing and use of antiretroviral therapy by the parents. Secondly, this is not correcting a clear genetic disorder. The CCR5 gene is common and probably has multiple purposes, especially in regard to immunity. Knocking out the gene unnecessarily in all tissues could have unintended consequences. Finally, this was performed at a time when CRISPR was still in its infancy. We didn't know much about off-target effects at this point and the implications that would have in the germline. Despite these concerns, his hospital approved the protocol and he was able to recruit several couples into the study. Ultimately, in 2018, he was able to successfully edit and implant twin embryos into one mother. In November of that year, the mother gave birth to two apparently healthy girls who were named Nana and Lulu. The news rocked the scientific community and spurred many discussions on the ethical considerations of using CRISPR for germline editing. As expected, he also received lots of backlash for his work. His paper was never published in any journal and he was put on trial in China. He pleaded guilty to the charge of illegal medical practice and was sentenced to three years in prison. At this point, we have no details about the current status of the CRISPR edited twins, Nana and Lulu. Editing of the human germline is a powerful tool and brings up many ethical considerations that are outside the scope of this talk. However, we as a scientific community and society need to grapple with these issues as the technology is here and has already been utilized. As we conclude, I hope you now understand that CRISPR has the potential to treat or eliminate countless genetic diseases and will become commonplace in our medical practice someday. We discussed the history of CRISPR's discovery, specific clinical applications of CRISPR, and what is in store for CRISPR in medicine in the future. I would now like to briefly share the lessons that I personally learned from the story of CRISPR, what I term best practices for scientific innovation that we can apply to our daily practice as scientists and physicians. Firstly, science and medicine is a team sport. There were countless researchers who made contributions to the discovery of CRISPR and all of their discoveries built off one another. The discovery of CRISPR also highlights the importance of teams, such as Downa and Charpentier and Baron Gunn Horvath. CRISPR would have not have been developed if it weren't for these collaborations. Next, do not discredit unexpected results. Mohika thought that he had done the sequencing wrong when he first saw the CRISPR repeats in his archaea species. Instead of resigning himself to failure and finding a different project, he looked at the results with a different perspective, and this paid off. The greatest discoveries are often serendipitous and unexpected in this way. And the key to making them is to keep an open mind. Next, basic science discoveries pave the way for advances in clinical medicine. Who would have thought that research, or research investigating the immune system of bacteria could lead to technology that could cure countless human genetic diseases? All types of science have the potential to be applied to practical or clinical use, and basic science as well as clinical research should be supported with funding. Finally, and very relevant to the current times, I learned from the story the importance of both in-person and virtual meetings in the advancement of science. I thought this sentiment was best expressed by a quote from Jillian Banfield a microbiologist at UC Berkeley who first introduced Jennifer Doudna to CRISPR. She said, small meetings where unpublished data and ideas can be shared and everyone helps everyone can change the world. In the case of CRISPR, that was definitely true. 
As we saw, particularly with Doudna and Charpentier's chance meeting at a conference in Puerto Rico, big ideas need in-person interaction and spontaneity, which virtual meetings just can't give us. Virtual meetings are by design scheduled and often have an agenda, which is not conducive to creativity and the formation of these big scientific ideas. However, virtual platforms can streamline application of those ideas once they've already been formed. This was again demonstrated by Doudna and Charpentier's collaboration in which their postdocs frequently checked in with one another using video conferencing technology. Going forward, I hope when the world is vaccinated and COVID is no longer the threat that it is today, we won't continue to have virtual meetings and conferences for everything, just out of sheer convenience. I think our world will miss out on many big ideas, innovations, and discoveries if we decide to do this. I'd like to thank Dr. Schnapp for inviting me to give this talk to the department today and for Clint Thayer for helping me with the setup. Thank you also to Dr. Smith and Dr. Goldberger for the helpful feedback as I was preparing for this presentation. I'd also like to thank the internal medicine residency education team, especially my co-chief residents, Sarah, Katie, and Victoria. This year due to COVID has been interesting to say the least, and I'm so grateful for their guidance, support, and friendship this year. I'd also like to thank my former and current research mentors, Neil Young, Sachiko Kajigaya, and Ryan Madison for teaching me how to conduct good science. And finally, I'd like to thank my husband, Taylor, and my mom and dad for all of their support this year and in the rest of my life. And finally, a quick plug for those who wanna learn more about CRISPR, I can't recommend this book enough. I had another topic planned completely for Grand Rounds, but then I read Walter Isaacson's The Codebreaker and was inspired to share the story of CRISPR with you today. I would highly recommend this book. Here are my references and photo credits, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak today. Great, thank you so much for a really wonderful overview. I love the personal touches um, and hearing about the history. Um, I, I think my other lesson is, uh, uh, particularly for Mohika, the term research, it's research. So go back and figure out what's already been done. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the other things about CRISPR technology is that it really has transformed um, animal models of research um, and uh, allowed us to, to more quickly develop knockout mm -hmm. uh, uh, animals without the, um, all of the, the time and effort for the traditional uh, models of knockout. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that and how CRISPR has been used to advance our understanding of disease pathogenesis in animals? Sure, uh, I did not talk about that today, but that's actually the biggest use of CRISPR is knocking out genes in either in vitro experiments, so in cell lines or in animals like mouse models and just looking to see what phenotype arises. So that's actually the easiest way to use CRISPR and what's mostly done in the lab. That's actually what my work was like at the NIH. I used CRISPR to knock out a gene to see how it led to the development of leukemia. And so that's actually spurred a revolution in basic science research as well, just because it's so easy now to just knock out a gene and to assess the phenotype. Yep. Um, and do you see a future for um, time limited uh, CRISPR editing. So, you know, one of the potential downsides of the clinical applications of CRISPR, as you mentioned, is off-target effects hmm. and um, concerns about uh, more long-term um, development of cancers, et cetera, because of off-target effects. Is there a way to have a time-limited um, editing of a gene of having your, your um, being short-lived to perhaps uh, one for treatment of cancer, for example, that once you've cured it, you no longer need your CRISPR edited um, T cells? That's a good question. I'm not familiar exactly with technology like that, that you're describing that's currently in use, but I can definitely see it being possible if you could somehow control the expression of the CRISPR engineered gene you could then control when the gene is turned on and off. So though I'm not familiar exactly with that technology being used today, I think it, it could definitely be possible. Yeah. Um, and there is, 
so John Sheehan mentions the addition of suicide genes um, to ex vivo modified cells. Yeah, so you have a, a time limited um, window by which your um, uh, editing activity is um, available. Right. Thank you, Dr. Sheehan. And I think the other, I'm glad you mentioned alpha-1 antitrypsin in your, your list of preclinical applications. You know, for, for alpha-1 antitrypsin and for many of the, the genes, you don't need high efficiency right. um, to actually correct the clinical um, phenotype. Um, right. so, I, so it may not be a downside of having low, you may be able to, to utilize that. Right. And I think in diseases like hemophilia, for instance, you don't need 100% of the normal protein in order to have a normal phenotype. So I think for many genetic disorders, we don't need that 100% gene editing efficiency to exert a clinical effect. And then a um, question from Matt, apparently the dragon slayer, Bruner. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of CRISPR delivery, are you aware of any cellular delivery systems um, for targeted delivery? I'm assuming it's uh, going to specific cell types. Sure, I'm not aware of anything that's currently active right now, but what I had heard has been in the pipeline is that you could control CRISPR by particular gene expression such that you can introduce it systemically, but it's only turned on, for instance, in your target cells. So that is one approach that I have heard has been in the pipeline for a more in vivo approach and a systemic approach to CRISPR delivery, but I have not seen any actual clinical data of that use as of yet. Great, okay. Well, Dr. Banachek, you have raised the bar um, for the chief resident presentations. Uh, it, thank you, it really was a wonderful overview um, and took us through from start to finish. And it's a very exciting technology. I think we're all yes. um, anxiously awaiting to see where it's going to go. And I think you know, the, your last part about the ethical considerations is a huge issue um, right. in science. And I, it's one of the areas where the technology seems to have gotten ahead of the ethics. Right. Um, so um, lots of discussion in that area, I know. Um, thank you so much. We look forward to continuing to have you come back uh, as a fellow to present some of your ongoing <laughs> research. Um, and I want to thank everyone for their attention and uh, enjoy the nice day. Thank you for your time. Okay. Have a good day. Bye-bye.